what that's about, but all right, fine. I'm going to accept that it's okay right. for you to record. Um, so don't send me a PDF and don't send me a, a link to a document, you know, sort of a uh, Google Doc or something of that nature where I need permission to go and find this document. I have to go look for your homework somewhere and then download it. No. All right. So um, save your homework as a, a Word document and send me the Word document. That way I can make any any grading on your doc, your paper itself, your homework itself, and send it back to you. If you want to make a copy of your homework before you send it to me so that uh, you can ensure that what you get back is exactly what you send to me, uh, that's fine. Okay. Uh, I think that covers all the um, administrative stuff. Um, in uh, on your PowerPoint presentation, you have a contact for me. Um, Kevin DeMeritt, of course, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, syllabus. Um, grading is on your, your notes as well. Homework is 30%. Uh, midterm exam, 30%. Final exam is 40%. Good afternoon. Kevin Yes, Kevin DeMeritt. Yes. Sanchez Markey. Okay. By all means. Oh, uh, if you, you, uh, are you vlogging on my first time? <laughs> oh, yeah. you, get the you probably get a book from um, the, the class notes okay. as part of your, your, your thingy, I think. Uh, what I was saying, um, um, homework is 30%, interim exam is 30%, final exam is 40%. Um, I tend to play around with a little 5% um, for persons who show up for every class and participate to some degree. Um, so it might push you over the top if you are like close to failing. Um, I think that covers all the administrative stuff. Okay. We started talking last class about some definitions. First of all, we said economics on the whole is a foundational course. course which means it's really intended um, to be the base for all the other classes that you take going forward, right? Uh, and we wanted to very clearly define what we meant by economics. And we define economics in your notes, you're following in your PowerPoint notes. We said economics is a study of choices made by individuals, firms, and the government when faced with scarcity, right? Uh, the key there, the key term we're using there is both choices and scarcity. Right? So economics is all about choices. And in particular, how those choices are made when we're faced with scarcity, scarce resources. Right? So the reason why, because we know that economic resources are scarce, so therefore um, we have to make choices in terms of how we use and allocate those resources. The most classic case of scarcity of resources is time and money. We never seem to have enough of either. And so therefore we have to make choices in terms of how we utilize those resources. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, uh, and I don't think you were, you, you missed the announcement. Um, beginning on Wednesday, we will move completely online. Beginning Wednesday. Beginning Wednesday. This coming Wednesday. This coming Wednesday. We did you receive an email from me maybe a week, ten days ago? I know we you 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 and I had communicated privately. I told you I missed the class. I didn't realize it was. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, I don't before that. Okay. Um. So yeah, one email from you just displaying some of the information about the class. So okay. It should also have included uh, a PowerPoint presentation. Thank you of the class notes, which will be most useful for, for you when we go online. Okay, that, that's fine. I, uh, it's not urgent. If, if not, I would send it again. Uh, but you will need that because that's what we follow going online uh, for the most part. I mean, you don't have to. You can always follow it in your book. Okay. Um, so then we wanted to define what we meant by macroeconomics specifically as being different from 
economics as a general description. Right? Macroeconomics, we said, is a study of choices made by individuals, firms, and the government, but how those choices affect the economy as a whole. Right? So macroeconomics is not about the study of choices, but how those choices affect the, the economy as a whole. So we are very interested in looking at the big picture when we talk about macroeconomics, we're looking at how the choices, uh, how those choices, were, uh, we're talking about scarce resources in this time, we're talking about scarce resources of the country as a whole, rather than individual resources that are scarce. So we're not necessarily talking about your, your salary or your income, we're talking about the income of the country as a whole. All right. So we're not talking about scarce resources that we do have, but how do we allocate those scarce resources when we're looking at what benefits the country as a whole? So macroeconomics is all about the big picture, which is different from microeconomics. Microeconomics is um, more micro, meaning small. Microeconomics would be the study of choices made by individuals, firms, and the government, because we're all talking about choices when we talk about economics. But in this case, microeconomics is a study of choices and how those choices affect individual markets, right, as opposed to the country as a whole. So what are the choices that we make that are going to affect, let's say, the labor market? Right? Or what are the choices that we make that's going to determine um, which school we send our child to? Yeah, right? uh, which brand of sneakers we buy? Right? So the choices that affect individual markets. Right? All right. So our concern this semester is going to be all about the big picture of macroeconomics as opposed to micro. Right? But before we do that, we, 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 uh, we need to understand that there are three fundamental questions that we need to consider, all right? Because when we're talking about economics as a whole, um, what we're doing in this, in this class, this semester, and probably the next, if you do micro, is that we're learning the language of economics, all right? And just like how you would have learned French or Spanish or whatever, uh, we're talking about the language of economics, all right? So a lot of things that we're going to do, certainly for the first half of this class, is really, it's like learning vocabulary and learning grammar, economic vocabulary, economic grammar, all right? So that in, at the end of the day, certainly the second half of the class, when we get into all the very nice policy discussions, we know we're using the same language, all right? Because the problem is that we talk about economics and we said economics is all about pretty much common sense. The problem is common sense varies from individual to individual. So when we learn this new economic language now, we can all be talking the same language so that we know when we use the same terms, we understand the same meaning of, that applies to those. All right. So part of, part, of, part of that is that we start with the first basic questions. If you're talking about economics, you say, what are the three fundamental questions that you're trying to answer? Uh, economic, any economic class, any economic course at any level. Three fundamental questions you're, you're looking to answer. First question, what is it that you're going to be able to produce? Because now we're talking about a country as a whole, all right? So if we're talking about macroeconomics, you're talking what goods and services are we going to produce? What are you going to do to earn income for your country as a whole, all right? What is your country going to produce? Very first fundamental question. Right. Second question, how are you going to do that? How are you going to produce what you think you want to produce? If you say you're in the Bahamas and you're in the tourism business, so what are you going to produce? We're going to produce tourism services. That's how we're going to make our money. Fine. That's, what, that's the what part. How are you going to do that? How are you going to produce these tourism services? Right. Well, I got sun, sand, and sea pretty waters, sunshine most of the day, even when it rains, it's liquid sunshine. You know, we could get some hotels, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, okay. We, we, we think we know how we can do this whole tourism thing, all right? So we know what we're gonna do. We're gonna do tourism services. We know how we're gonna do it. We, ha we have sunshine and sea and hotels, etc. Last fundamental question then, after you know what you're gonna produce, how you're gonna produce it, who is going to, who are you going to sell this to? Who is going to consume this? Fundamental question, all right? Because you could produce as much tourism services as you want. You got sunshine and sea, 
you got the hotels, but you got COVID. So you know, but you don't want to sell this to nobody. Right? A fundamental question is, uh, uh, no matter what you have in terms of what you're going to produce, you know what you're going to produce, you know what you're going to produce it for. But if you got nobody who you can sell it to, you still ain't got no place. So the three fun questions of economics that we want to be able to answer, what to produce, how are we going to do it, who are we going to sell it to? Now, macroeconomics can only answer the first one. Macroeconomics can only answer the question of what we're going to produce. Other branches of economics is going to address the other questions. Whether you're talking about managerial economics, marketing economics, finance economics, they would answer some of the other questions. But our concern with macroeconomics starts off with when we start looking at this country, any country, any economy, how do we know what to produce? What can they produce? Because right? you can't produce everything because we just said scarce resources. All right. So, but you have to produce something if you're going to support your people. Okay. So how do we go about determining what to produce? Well, if you start thinking about what to produce, it helps to know what you have to play with, right? Uh, ain't no use you deciding that you know uh, you want to be a banker, but you never finish high school, right? You want to be a mechanic, but you know you're all thumbs. So, and then now let's let's extend that to a country as a whole. You can't say, you know, I want to build a ski resort. You know, if all you got is flat line. Right. So I live in the Bahamas. I'm sorry, I don't have the best idea in the world about a ski resort, but you know. We ain't got no snow, we ain't got no mountain, but I got this idea in my head. You know, I've been dreaming about being, no, no, no. Right. So we need to figure out what we have available to work with, and then we can start thinking about what we can produce. So to figure out what we need to, what we have to work with, really in economic terms, this is called what factors of production we have available to work with. What are the factors of production that you look at any economy, and once you determine what factor of production is available in that economy, that gives you a broad idea of what you can begin to produce. Okay, so what are these factors of production? There's five of them that we want to consider. Let's start with the first one. The first factor of production is what we call natural resources. Natural resources, uh, you know, if you are the like, call it, you know, um, Things produced by an act by acts of nature or acts of God, if you will, if that's um, the way you roll. Things created by acts of nature and in turn used to produce goods and services. All right, this is stuff you know that we met here when we arrived. All right, we didn't create the sun, sun, and sea. It's just the way it is. Our location on the planet is what uh, drives that sun, sun, and sea. Now, you may be living in a country or an environmental economy that has gold, silver, platinum, uranium, yeah. or you may just have tall mountains and snow. Uh, you may have rivers. All right? Whatever you have, that's what you work with. Uh, this is what we have in terms of natural resources, so this is what we have to work with. So first factor of production that we want to consider is called natural resources. All right. What do we have available to work with that came with the country? All right. Acts of God, acts of nature, however it is. All right. Okay, fine. What else? Facts of production that we want to consider. Uh, people, labor. All right. Uh, do you have a lot of people? Do you have a little bit of people? Are these people educated or not? All right. Um, so labor, properly defined from our perspective, labor is defined as the human effort, both physical and mental, and ignore the mental part of it. It is physical effort that is in turn, sorry, it is, the human effort, both physical and mental, which is in turn used to produce goods and services. Right? 
whether you're working with your hand or working with your brain, at the end of the day, you're dead tired, you've been putting in some work. Right. So labor is the human effort, both physical and mental, which is in turn used to produce goods and services. Right. So back to our discussion of arms. Okay, we know what natural resources we have available to work with. We got sun, sign, and sea. What about people? We ain't got much. All right. Uh, we got a population of maybe 420,000 in total. All right. All right. So slice that in half because uh, you have to eliminate all the little children and old people, little children who are still in school, old people who retired. All right. So that leaves you with 210. All right. Uh, no, I don't want you turning off. Thank you. Come on. So I was, I was up to what, 210? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's eliminate the kids who are off in school, all right? Because they are not doing any work uh, in terms of labor force, not yet. Maybe disabled, handicapped, mentally disabled, et cetera. All right, handicapped, mentally disabled, them set in jail. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, people who are in long-term hospice, whether you are in a hospital or in Sunderland's. All right. So uh, let's say that's another 10,000. Right. So that leaves you with 200,000 people, what we call the labor force. All right. So you have 200,000 people for an economy that's roughly what? Uh, Nine billion. Like I said, we don't have a lot of people. The population is nine billion. Yeah. GDP, the size of the economy. Oh, oh. We'll talk about that in a moment because remember now we're looking at the entire economy, so it can come up at some point in our discussion. How we get more precise numbers, but yes, roughly speaking. So that doesn't seem like a lot of people. Yeah, for the economy, our size and sophistication. Hence, we have things like uh, work permits. Right. Hence, we have, uh, despite the fact that we bitch and complain, yes, I can use the word bitch because, you know, <laughs> we are adults. Go ahead, my Enjoying the class food, do you think? We have a number of illegal immigrants yeah. who do a lot of things that we either don't want to do or can't do or don't have the population to do. Right. Could you imagine if we, we needed to find enough people to do all the uh, yard maintenance and the housekeeping kind of stuff. Right. Um, you go on any construction site, you go on any, um, um, lawn care, gardening, which color things? Um, landscaping. landscaping. And you will find uh, that the vast majority of the employees are non payments. Now, I don't know if they're legal or illegal, but non payments. Right? And the point is that you know, it'll, it'll be very difficult for us to continue to support this economy. Um, with the size population that we have, the working force that we have. So we need some additional labor. I'm happy to argue with anyone about whether or not, how we should get this labor. Send, a, send them all back and make them come back the right way. I have no issues. That's an argument we can make. Uh, but the point is that 200,000 is not enough people, um, especially now when you start going beyond New Providence and Grand Bahama, and you go to a lot of the family islands where you find very little people. Right. Acklage, Crooked Island, Cat Island, Meguana, very thinly populated. Despite that, all of them are bigger than the Providence. Okay, so uh, labor. Uh, what else? We know we have sunshine and sea. 
you know, we need to consider how much people we have to work with. You know, we in China or India with trade loads of people that you can just throw at something. Uh, what else we need? Uh, what is called physical capital. Physical capital, let's get the precise definition down. Physical capital is an object made by humans and used to produce goods and services. Physical capital is an object made by humans and used to produce goods and services. We tend to shorthand it in economics as plant equipment and machinery, but really it covers anything that is produced by humans and in turn used for goods and services. So if we're in this class today and we are producing economic services, educational services, so everything that we're using in, in pursuit of that goal, every single thing in this room is, is used in, in our case to further that goal. All right, so all of this is what we consider physical capital. All right, but if we're looking at a large economy, physical capital will be, will be all of our buildings. It will certainly be our hotels. It'll be all the equipment that we use. It'll be all the imported plants, you know, physical capital. Um, so that is in turn used to produce goods and services. So we start off with, with how much God gave us you know, natural resources, how much people we've been producing right, uh, to make use of these natural resources, I mean, how much physical capital we can acquire to assist us in this production process, because, you know, um, we don't make stuff in the Bahamas like that, you know, um, we don't build cars or computers or um, pens or markers or papers or books or um, water jugs or, you know, basically, I think I, I mentioned this in the last class. Pretty much the only thing in this room that's made in the Bahamas is us. Mm -hmm. So everything else, physical capital we've acquired. Okay. And then we have what's called human capital. Human capital, on the other hand, we have to be able to clearly distinguish between human capital and labor. Human capital, very clearly in our definition, is the knowledge and skills acquired by a worker through education and experience. So human capital is our education and our experience. And we then use that to produce goods and services. So currently, what, you, what you're doing now in this course is acquiring human capital. Right. You are building up your experience and your expertise so that at the end of the day, once you've completed this course, you know, uh, would you mind passing me that? Sure, sure, sorry about about that. Yeah. You expect to have increased your stock of human capital, and hopefully that should bring you some additional dollars from your employer. All right, because you said, listen, I, uh, I'm more educated. You know, I know stuff I didn't know before, and I think I'm in a position to help you out. All right. And lastly is entrepreneurship. Middleman. Entrepreneurship, let's get the definition down uh, very precisely. Entrepreneurship is the effort used to coordinate the production and sale of goods and services. Entrepreneurship is the effort used to coordinate the production and sale of goods and services. It's the middleman. It's the person that stands between the producer and the consumer. All of us don't have the opportunity to go into the farm or go into the factory. So we need somebody to go and do that. The stand between us and the wholesaler. And that is the entrepreneur. That's also the same person who collects all the money from various investors around the world, put that money together in one big pot and build an elaborate hotel and resort in the Bahamas. 
All right. So the foreign investor is in fact an entrepreneur. All right. So those are the five factors of production. And once we understand what fact, what we have available to work with then, that can determine what we can produce. So we know we have sun sanity, God give us that, All right? Now, then we said, okay, we, we got so much people, but we, we think we got people, All right? We got maybe 200,000 to play with, uh, we, get, we got some people. All right. Physical capital, what we need, well, uh, we need hotels, right? We need uh, uh, jet skis. Uh, we need uh, sports fishing boats, yachts. Uh, we need all the accoutrements that goes with a tourism industry, right? So that's that's our natural resources, the physical capital. We need. Human capital. All right. So we need to train these people. All right. So we need to spend some money. Our hotel money, we can't just, you know, start it on the bike. We need to invest in some training programs. Yeah. And that may mean at some point sending some of these people off, you know, to get training from elsewhere. So that, you know, we have improved their stock of human capital. They now get some training, got some experience got some education, so they should be able to run our hotels. And then of course, uh, where are we getting these hotels from? All right. uh, we don't think we have enough money to build billion dollar resorts all over the place. Um, so we can entice some people to bring their billions of dollars to build some hotels here, because they ain't got some sign and see where they live. So, you know, if you want to use our sunshine and see, well, maybe you should invest some of your money uh, here. Entrepreneurship. All right. The result is we are now in the tourism business. Right. And we then make our money in tourism and then use that money to buy all the other stuff that we need. Basically. Okay, so. Now that we have an idea of what we're working with, once we've determined what resource is available to any given economy, we then evaluate what goods and services we can produce. All right. All right. Here's the problem for us. The very first problem we're going to run into, an economy, any economy, even our economy, is a complex animal. All right. Um, it's difficult when we start talking about economics. So how do we go about evaluating and assessing every little thing that's happening in our economy, everything we're producing, every person that's employed? It's kind of complicated. But we have to do something. All right. If we're trying to look at what we're going to produce as an economy, because our, our concern is macroeconomics, big picture. We need to find a way of somehow consolidating our discussion in a way that allows us to still follow what's going on, but not get lost, lost in the details. Right? So that's what we're trying to do. And we can talk about in a second how we do that, but we know that's what we need to do. Right? So if we're going to apply that to what we're going to produce, then we need to talk about what is called the production possibilities curve. And I do need to use the board, unfortunately. Uh, for those following online. Production Mr. Department. Department, I have a question. Yes, that will be Ms. Seymour. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned the five factors of production, right? Yes. My question is, are these um, factors, like not say essential, but is it a requirement? Can I, can I use either or, or must I use all five? Like if I'm considering, if I'm considering this. In any economy, all five would be present. The question would be in what, in what percentage? Say for example, um, you are, uh, you're India. You have a lot of people, all right? So your labor, the labor part of it is abundant. So you have a lot of people. Um, do you have a lot of physical capital? Probably not. 
you don't have a lot of, of plant equipment and machinery, which has a lot of people. All right. Do you have a lot of entrepreneurs? Eh, maybe not, but you got a lot of people. All right. Do you have a lot of natural resources? Uh, a bit, but you got a lot of people. So then what you should do then, you focus your economy on production and industries that require a lot of labor, particularly a lot of low skill labor. Right. This was the case in China up until the last couple of decades where they had a lot of people, but very little of some of these other um, factors of production. And then you have an economy like let's say Canada. Canada has relatively little, few people for the size of its economy, but what do they have? Lots of natural resources, all right? They have mountains and rivers and snow and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they also have lots of land and forests. So they focused a lot of their early um, economic development in terms of natural resources, lumber, um, you know, that kind of stuff, but they also have oil and coal and gas, but they also have um, just off the coast, um, a lot of the seas, North Atlantic, which is has a ton of fish, you know, schooling fish, not like what we have in the Bahamas with nice little pretty reef fish and occasional grouper. They have schools and schools of jacks and cods and haddocks and polacks and you know, that kind of stuff. So that's where they focus their, their attention. Um, then you look at someplace like the United States, who has plenty of everything. Right? So they're able to do a variety of things based on the facts of production because uh, they have lots of natural resources, uh, lots of people, uh, lots of human capital. This is, you know, that's why most of us end up going there for school, et cetera. And they also have lots of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs. So they have plenty of everything. And so they have a certain advantage. And then you have someplace like, I don't know, uh, some small Caribbean islands who have not much of anything. So then what do you do? Right. I think I told a story last time about Dominica, very tiny little island, which is a mountain and some, you know, um, some rainforest, not a lot of people, not a lot of anything. Right. So all the facts of production will always be present um, the question is that in what, in what quantities and what percentage relative to your economy as a whole, and that is going to affect um, what you're going to produce. All right. Okay. Um, what we, what our concern here then is how are we going to assess this? Right? And that's where, where our production possibilities curve comes in. Also, you may see it in some textbooks as production possibilities frontier. But really, what is what it's intended to do, um, if you're following in your notes, is that it's all about how we're going to utilize our resources in the most efficient manner possible. The production possibilities curve gives us an opportunity to assess um, the optimal means of utilizing our resources. Right. That is, we have sun, sand, and sea. Do, are, we really, do, are we really should be thinking about building, you know, um, smog inducing factories? You know, is that really the best use of our resources? Right? We have uh, crystal clear waters and beautiful reefs. Is, is that really the best use of our resources to go into, I don't know, um, fishing with fishnets, tearing up the sea and scooping up everything that happens to be out there? Is it? All right, stuff to consider, all right? Um, we only got 200,000 people. Should we really be in a business where, you know, you need tons and tons of, you know, low-skilled labor? I don't know, all right. But the idea is that the production possibilities curve allows us to make that assessment, make that judgment. All right, so the production possibilities curve This is mine. Oh, 
okay, that's better. Right. So production possibilities curve at a PPC looks something like that, all right? And this is the PPC. Now, there are a couple of things that we first want to talk about. The first thing we said is points on the PPC are points of efficiency. The PPC for very simplified form says, okay, we have some sort of factor production. And we want to know how can we produce what we're producing in the most efficient manner possible. Right. So let's say, Okay. Oh, 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 oh. So um, my wife and I, yes, I'm married, uh, been for a while. My wife and I, uh, when we retire, uh, which is not going to be too long for me. Uh, anyway, my wife is from Long Island, high yellow, red, conky Joe, Long Island people. Right? Um, and a couple of years ago, uh, when her grandmother passed away, why did I get, get me distracted? Anyhow, point is, they have generation property in Long Island. Okay. And um, when her, mother, her grandmother passed away maybe a decade ago, we took the opportunity to actually sort out the generation property because you know how generation property it gets, nasty, it can get really messy. Nasty, yeah. Right. But anyway, we sorted out. Um, bottom line is that um, she ended up with five acres, I think. Um, um, that is in her name. It's not in the generation, not in the, the, the family name. It's going to be a dog. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So I can describe this properly. Um, there is, it's in, I don't know if you know Long Island. Anyway, it doesn't matter what we're going to um, Long Island is just a long, skinny island. But there is the road, and then there's maybe 10 yards, then the beach. On one side of the road, I oh, have a That's the road. All right. This is the sea. But there is some space between the road and the sea. It's like, it's not really a cliff, but it's high up enough. And on the other side of the road is her property. Our property now, because I'm the husband. And, uh, oh. Our property. <laughs> no, you know. Okay. It's a five acres. Right. A large chunk of it is swampland, wetland. Right. Fine. Yeah. So be it. All right. Now, we were talking about this. Two things. Um, we could fill this in five acres. Get some nice soil, put on it, then get some fertilizer. We can have a little farm, you know, um, our retirement. Something to do, you know, we could grow some watermelon and some whatever it is that people grow on, plant, on farms in the Bahamas. Um, mangoes, so what do you know? Some farm stuff. Okay. All right. Pineapple, onions, tomatoes, you know. And have a nice little farm. You know, okay, have, have, have some people from, from, you know, in the area to help with a farm kind of thing. Uh, we can make do and get rich off it, but nice little stuff. All right. We could also fill in this and put up a little B and B, bed and breakfast. All right. As you're talking about it, two of us, we can manage a little bed and breakfast, maybe um, eight, eight rooms total. So you don't have no more, than maybe a dozen guests. All right. A nice little um, old fashioned style Bahamian architecture. It can be new, of course, but, you know, um, and we can manage that, you know, and people, you know, they can always go across the road to the sea, so they got beach to play with all for days, this Long Island, you yeah. know. Here's the problem. If we make this into a farm, we can't also have a and b on the same property. Because it's a farm now. We can't, okay, let's say we put a B and B on the property. We can't put a farm there too. It's only one piece of land. You either want all the other with it, you can't do both. That's our problem. All right. And that 
brings us back to the production possibilities curve. Let's say you're talking about this kind of stuff. And let's say this is um, agriculture, call it A, and call it hotels or tourism. Right? And the fact of the matter, and this is absolutely true in the Bahamas, we used to have agriculture of a kind on what is now Paradise Island. Hog Island is what is it, was its original name, and it earned that name because that's where a lot of farmers used to have their pigs. Hogs. Right. Why do we not have hogs on Paradise Island now? Because it wasn't compatible uh, with a hotel. The last thing you want as a hotel guest complaining about the stink of a pig. All right. So then, let's say you, this is all the land on Paradise Island. Right, right now, right, it's 100% as a tourism residence type facility. Right. Whether it's a hotel or a golf course or the rich people all the way on the end of the island uh, or the rich people in the condos, you know, rich people. Ain't nobody here have any kind of agricultural stuff going on on Paradise Island. You know, unless you got one, one tomato plant on your deck and, you know, no, right. 100%. Right. We can do this for, say, any island in the Bahamas. All right. Back to our Long Island issue. All right. If we decide that, let's say we have, I don't know, 40% um, of the island we're using for agriculture, and 60% of the island we're using for tourism research services, a point on the PPC says that we are fully utilizing the real estate, the land that's available on Long Island, all right? There is no piece of that island that is a swamp that just wasted away, all right? There's also no piece of that island that we've allocated for a farm, but really is better suited for a hotel, all right? On the PPC is points of efficiency. It's the best that we can do with the resources that are available to us. Right. If in fact now, if our factor production in this case is labor, then on the PPC means that we're utilizing our labor resources in the most efficient manner possible. Everybody who wants a job has a job and is working full time. Right. So nobody's working part time who would like to work full time. Right. Uh, there's nobody working in a field that is not suitable for their temperament, education, and experience. Right. Everybody is working full time and they're working in the best, most efficient field for them. It also means that there's no slunking. There's no two hour lunches. There's no coming in half hour late every morning and leaving half hour early. Right. Everybody's being operating at the most efficient uh, at their best. Did we tell you the announcement? Sorry. Um, beginning Wednesday, we're going to go entirely virtual. So when you get off five o'clock, go and go and take off your shoes. You know, make some deep. Yeah, but then all it's mean you got to deal with children and husband or boyfriend or whatever it is. But you know, I mean, you know, handle your business. <laughs> But the point is, it's virtual. Okay. <laughs> Bad Wednesday. Okay. I, I'll send an email to everybody, okay. just confirm. Uh, but I think this is everybody, because it's four you and, couple, and three online. That should be everybody, but we'll see. All right. Uh, so for the production possibilities curve, I don't know if I haven't taken some time, but I need to reset that. It's all about points on the PPC at points of efficiency. Whatever factor of production we're talking about, it is utilizing that factor of production in the most efficient manner possible, All right? So points on the PPC is the best that we can do as an economy. It's the best that we can do 
given what we have to work with. All right. Um, you know, once we utilize all of our natural resources in the most efficient manner possible, there's no more natural resources to get. All right. We can somehow acquire more sun, sand, or sea from somebody else. All right. What we got is what we got. Right. And that applies to all the facts of production except, sorry, that applies to only natural resources. All other facts of production, we can get more of from outside of our economy. We certainly get more labor, we get more people. All right. We're already getting more people whether we like it or not. Uh, can we get more plant equipment and machinery? Obviously. Uh, can we get more human capital? Sure. Every time one of our, our, our kids or ourselves go off somewhere for training or, or school, we are acquiring additional education from outside the country, outside the economy. Um, obviously, um, uh, a foreign investor is an entrepreneur from outside of our economy. All right, so we're getting money from outside the, the economy. All of our facts of production except natural resources. All right, and there's only one example in the Palmas and the history of the Palmas that I can recall where, in fact, we have been able to get natural resources from outside the, the economy. And that is if you, well, maybe you guys don't know, you'll have told me because, you know, I don't know. <sighs> I didn't think I like that. No, y'all didn't know this. Well, that was good. Anyway, uh, okay. Alco, citrus farms. Right. Um, you know, we, we grow a significant amount of citrus in Abaco. And a lot of it has to do with, if you go back to the 50s, I think, or 60s, where a lot of this started, there was actually some imported soil. Um, and that spurred a lot of the Abaco farms. And that's the only time I recall. And obviously, dirt, soil is a natural resource. Salt is dirt. Sorry? Salt. Soil, dirt. No, I'm saying, I mean, we would consider salt a natural resource. Sure, but we produce. Interesting. No, I mean, we don't produce salt um, um, as a natural resource. We produce salt as a, 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 um, a physical capital. Because I, I, I wanted to ask, was like, I know it's a difference, but in some cases, I can see where there could be some confusion. For lack of but physical capital is if you're using something to produce something else. So we use for salt, for example, to produce uh, culinary services. You're adding it to food, all right? If you rest a restaurant, it doesn't count if you're cooking your own food, that's a different story, but you can certainly use it to produce culinary food. So in that case, it will be, it will be a physical capital, all right? Um, the salt that we're producing in, 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 in Agua, a natural resource, all right? Because uh, that's provided by nature. So when we farm the salt in, you know, go and sell it as it's as a natural resource. Yes, we are so, exporting natural resource. So when we can get the salt and we use it to go open up a restaurant, use the salt to cook, now it's a physical. Exactly. Oh, okay. So it's an application of products, how would you become how it's categorized? Okay. Well, I, what is the product being used for? Sorry, what's that? What's the product being used for? Right. Remember, uh, salt in this case is being used to produce something else. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, okay. So, back to our conversation. Points on the PPC are points of efficiency. It's the best that we can do given what's available in our economy, right? So in that case then, points outside the PPC, if you wanna produce, let's say, uh, this is agriculture and this is hotels, but somehow you want more hotels or tourism services, as you will, say 75%, but you don't want to reduce the amount of land you have available or the amount of people you have available in the agricultural sector. Well, you would have to get 
this would be a point generally that you cannot obtain because it requires resources that you don't have available within your economy. The only way to get to that point would be resource, um, resources coming from outside the economy. If, if here we're talking about the number of workers in each sector, right? let's say you have a certain number of workers working in the agricultural sector, your population, and you have a certain portion of your population working in the hotel industry. Right? If somehow you build another hotel, right, where are you gonna get the actual workers from? If everybody's already working, the only way you can do that, the only way you can get out here is bringing extra workers in from outside the economy. All right? That's the only way that can happen. All right? Similarly, let's say in that case, this, our resources is financial, money. And let's just do it. Let's, I think we started talking last time about budgets. And let's say you have a national budget. And this is your production possibilities frontier for your national budget. And we said, I think last time, if I recall correctly, uh, we did what? We did healthcare. All right. We did healthcare and education. All right. So to simplify things, we said we can only spend our budget, our entire national budget, on two things. All right. We can build more hospital and clinics or we can build more schools, or both, all right? So we've allocated our resources uh, and we're going to spend our budget money on healthcare and or education, right? And let's say we're on the PPC. If we're on the PPC, that means that our entire budget is fully allocated, one, but it's not just fully allocated, it's fully allocated in the most efficient manner possible, all right? We're spending money on education. We're not spending money on education. That, is, that would have been better spent on healthcare or vice versa, all right? It also means that there is no mismanagement of our resources, all right? Whatever resource we have available is being fully utilized in the best way possible. There's no mismanagement. There's no mis misuse. There is no, I don't know, uh, misallocation, right? There's no giving contract to our friends or associates for a little kickback, et cetera. Uh, there's no corruption. There's no criminality. There's no teeth in, all right? Efficiency means that we're, to be on that PPC means that that's the best we can possibly do with the money, all right? So then, in that case, we cannot be out here. We cannot spend any additional money because all the money we have available is very spent. And not only is very spent, it's spent in the best way we can spend it, all right? So points on the PPC are points of efficiency. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about this combination or this combination or this combination, any point on the PPC is efficient. Right. That's a good outcome. That's a good use of the resources. Right. It also means that we cannot, we cannot go um, spend more money on healthcare or education that we don't have. If we wanted to, we must get money from outside the economy. Right. This also means that, we're, remember when we talk about efficiency, um, it means that any money, if we could have borrowed, we're already borrowing, all right? Uh, I, I think this is something that a lot of students tend to raise that, okay, what if we borrowed money from whomever, all right? It still means that we are on the PPC because we're still being efficient. Now, let's say on the other hand, that we're on the PPC, so we fully allocated our, our budget and we get a grant from someone else, somewhere else. Uh, somebody like the World Bank or the IMF or the Inter-American Development Bank or the Caribbean Development Bank or the Asian Development Bank or Uncle Sam, whoever, all right? So they give us some money. All right. The presumption is that 
we are going to continue to efficiently allocate that extra money the same way we did the previous money. Right. And unless there is something that has changed, um, particularly if, if you have this question that comes up, uh, unless the question tells you that there's a change in your government's perspective, uh, you, you should assume that their uh, choice of allocation previously will continue to be the same. So for example, if previously they were doing uh, 40, no, Forty, sixty percent allocation, right? So that's how they was they were spending the money. Forty percent went to healthcare, sixty percent went to education. Right? If that's what they were doing previously, then any extra money we must assume that they're going to spend that same extra money: forty percent healthcare, sixty percent education. Unless the question tells you otherwise, you cannot assume in your head some of allocation. Right? If the previous allocation was 90% uh, healthcare and 10% education, you must assume that any new money is going to be spent exactly the same way, right? If in fact it was the other way around, and this was, I don't know, 30% um, and this was 70%, again, you must assume that any extra money is going to be allocated in the same way, all right? Unless the government tells you that their priorities have changed, you must assume that their priorities are the same. Right? The result is that extra money is going to cause the whole PPC to shift outward. And it's going to shift outward symmetrically. A symmetrical shift in the PPC says that um, our resources, these new resources that we got, we're allocating it in the same way that we allocated our old resources, right? So an outward shift in the PPC says that this, our, our, this additional resources uh, is affecting our economy equally. Right. Think about this. Um, if you remember before the last election, yeah, you know, and this is a, Economics class, not a poly sci class. So we're going to jump into the whole politics thing, uh, which I find exceedingly boring. But anyway, there was this guy, um, trying to remember his name, um, wasn't from one of the major parties. Stuff about giving the Amen money. money. That's the name? Yeah. He said he was going to give like the Amen's $100,000 each. $100,000 each. He's getting that money from that ain't important. Yeah, it it just, it. Don't go hit your head when you start thinking that deep. <laughs> all right. But the point is, all right, because we're, we're talking economics, not politics. If every Bahamian got $100,000 each, how does that affect the Bahamian economy no. when you talk about individual sectors? How could you bring some of the work like that? Yeah, OK. <laughs> But Maybe. I, uh, I probably didn't tell it's going to be having a bit of money. Everybody would charge more than everybody get the money for it. Maybe. But would it not affect all sectors equally? Pretty much, yeah. Would everybody get on go? Yeah, everybody. Does everybody get it? Because, because it, it, means, it doesn't mean that everybody can spend that money on the same thing? No. 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 Right. So you expect the whole economy to go up mm -hmm. equally. Mm -hmm. right. That's what we're talking about. You will have an outward shift yeah. in the PPC. Mm -hmm. It will affect all sectors, because because there's such a, a, a the persons there's no there's nothing to say that the population is going to lean in towards one sector or another, and how they're going to spend that extra money. You see this in, in certain um, you certainly see this in real life whenever uh, the government gives a lump sum payment to say civil servants, and, and that they did some years ago uh, the. First Christie administration gave all civil servants, I think it was $1,500 lump sum. It was like just before Christmas kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Um, there was nothing to say that to, it wasn't, there was no note to civil service say you can only spend this money 
in certain places or in certain things or in certain industries or in certain sectors. Right? And so because they were able to spend this money however they want, uh, there was no conditions attached, uh, one would expect that um, the money spent will, will cover the gamut of industries. So the entire, the entire economy moved out slightly. All right, that's what we're talking about. Where an increase in the factor of production affects all sectors equally, we see this symmetrical shift in the production possibilities curve. All right, but what happens on the other hand Same two sectors, healthcare and education. Now, instead of uh, them giving us money to do it as we wish, all right, uh, let's say this is the World Bank. And the World Bank, uh, we ain't saying nothing about how you run your country, all right? That's entirely up to you, all right? But we are willing uh, to commit a certain amount of resources to build a new hospital. All right. So we've, we've, we didn't give you a grant of money to build a hospital. We can build a hospital. All right. That way, we're pretty sure that they can be the way up to the side that we want, uh, using the resources we have available. We can make sure we can get it done. All right. So, does that impact the education system at all? No, is it a hospital, right? Yeah, yeah. hospital. No. No? No. No school? No. Because they say spend it in a hospital. So, whatever, whatever we want uh, in terms of our allocation for education, okay. it didn't change. Right. All right. What about our health care? That increase. Increase. All right. So we would see an increase in healthcare services because now we got another hospital. The result is that we would see a shift in the production possibilities curve, but only relative to the sector that got the additional resources. All right. We see more healthcare, more clinics, another hospital. Right? But we don't see any additional resources being allocated to education. Now, there are some of you may want to take this one step further and argue about, well, if they build another hospital, then we can shift our resources more towards education because we now have extra, extra money. But unless your question tells you that, you cannot make that assumption. Right? If you don't have the information to support that, no. You cannot make that assumption. All right, fine. Um, the World Bank build us a hospital. Uh, and since we are savvy Bahamians, uh, we prevail on the Inter-American Development Bank. So, you know, listen, man, I was gonna do some school. You know, we, we straight with the hospital now, but you know, we keep pumping our kids and you know, they gotta go someplace. So, you know, I, being busy out of school, right? What does that mean for the healthcare system? It doesn't change. Ain't nothing, nothing changed here. Right. But now, the increase in education, school gone, we got another school. Oh, oh schools, however it is. The result is that we're gonna see a shift in the production possibilities curve. Asymmetrical is what we call when only shift, you know, one is shift in one direction. An asymmetrical shift, but only in the area in which we have these additional resources. All right. And you can do this in terms of any Factor production. Okay. Let's say if we're talking about um, an island economy where, where you, you have um, agriculture and fishing. 
because that's what you do, right? Uh, you either have a little farm or you go fishing. If the guy who owns a farm gets a little tractor, clearly he can produce more farm products. So the uh, production possibilities curve for agriculture for that community will shift outward. But that doesn't do anything for the guy fishing because he still got the same old fishing dinghy. Right? That doesn't help him at all. On the other hand, if in fact he gets a new boat, now they could produce more fishing resources, or fisheries resources, more fish, yeah. cow, crab, whatever. Um, but that doesn't do anything for the farmer. Right? So the production possibilities curve is shift out, but only for the fishing guy. Right? That's what we're talking about. All right. So lastly, Let's put our original PPC back. Healthcare and education. Hurricane blow through. Tear up a bunch of stuff. All right. It blow down both clinics and schools. What happens to our PPC? Nothing because by can we produce the same amount of health care? No. Can we produce the same amount of education? No. We're producing less of both. Right. But the allocations. But yes, allocation is the same. No, no, the proportion is the same. We still won't spend 40, 60, right. but we got less. That's up 40, 60, right? That's right. total results. Right. So, what happens? So, what happens to our PPC? So, it'll be symmetrical now instead of asymmetrical? It will be, it will be symmetrical. But inward shift. Inward shift. Yeah. Uh, right. Inward, right. Inward shift. Right. Because less money to go around. Yeah. Not less money for, for a specific sector, less money for every sector. Right. All right. So, now let's add some, before we can proceed further, um, let's add some more vocabulary to our language. So a couple more definitions that will help us as we move on to the next conversation. Um, I want most of these you're familiar with, but I want to make sure that we get the, the precise definition down uh, because the, these are the kind of definitions that probably shows up uh, on the multiple choice section of your exams. All right. Okay. The first is uh, what we mean by a It is an arrangement that allows buyers and sellers to exchange goods and services for money. And there are two types of markets that we want to consider. The first Hello? I didn't hear knock up. Not I hope you even recognize that. Let me see.
Yeah. We can hear you now. Uh, let me hear you now. <laughs> All right. Let me know now. I had a scream for the IT people. Oh. I don't, I don't know. That's outside of my area of expertise. Okay. So the, the point is, um, for definitions, you want to be able to recognize um, the correct definition. All right. I won't ask you to write out a definition. Uh, that's high school. Right. This is all about understanding. Right. So I want you to be able to recognize the definition. Uh, and then some of them, um, I hate to use the word tricky because you know, students have a, 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 an idea that tricky means I'm trying to trip you up. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case at all. But some of the definitions require a better, more precise understanding of the term. Because remember what we're trying to do. We're learning a new language, all right? Which means that um, sometimes, not the case here, um, you know in your head what you come across previously, um, a definition of a term, a market, for example, all right? And what we're saying is that, um, okay, you know how um, two, three, four years old, you learn to talk. I don't, I don't know what, 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 what age babies learn to talk, but yeah. They start talking. They can't write, they can't spell, but they can speak, right? All of us in this room are native English speakers. So why do we take English course, English language, English literature? It, it, the, the reason is very simple. We, have, we need to be able to understand the grammar, the punctuation, the vocabulary of the language, all right? And even though we're native English speakers, very often a lot of us struggle with English. Yeah, I can't spell to save my life. Yeah. Um, and this is the same thing we're talking about here, all right? What we're trying to do when we're trying to understand the language of economics is we're trying to understand the grammar, the punctuation, the vocabulary. In that case, we just need to learn it. We need to be able to recognize words and phrases, even if we can't, if we don't necessarily have to regurgitate it word for word. And the reason why it becomes important is gonna be the second half of this semester in about three weeks. When we start <clears throat> applying these terms to our discussion of policy issues, right? Because this is not about a rote class. This is, economics is all about applying that understanding, all right? So one of the key things that we're gonna talk about a lot is that, um, when these people who, you know, y'all decide to vote for, <laughs> I, I, whatever, whether it's, it's it red, gold, or blue, or green, or whatever the people is, right? Uh, you want to be able to understand where they're coming from and be able to say for sure, not just in your gut that they fools, you're able to, you know, you have some knowledge, some experience, some education now to say, yeah, I was right all along, they're fools, all right? Or, you know, if you're going to use a more colorful language, that's entirely up to you. All right. So let's see if we can um, add um, some language, uh, some terms um, to our economic language. Right. So we've described a market. A market is where goods and services exchange for money. Now, that's simple enough. We, we understand that. All right. And there are two types of markets that we, we, we need to be um, take account of right? things we know, but we haven't may or not actually have thought about it in precisely these terms. The two types of market is a factor market, right? and this is a market for the facts of production. Those same five that we talked about previously, right? A market for facts of production. So we have obviously you have a labor market, right? And that's where we buy and sell labor. Labor. We don't buy and sell people, but we buy and sell their time. All right, we buy and sell their energy, we buy and sell their effort, all right? Um, obviously there is a market for physical goods. Obviously everything you go to the store and buy, all right? There's a market for human capital. The education market is a good, good way of looking at that. We buy and sell education services. Right? Obviously there's a market for entrepreneurship and that's where you have your, uh, your investment in capital. 
right? Whether you're talking about stocks and shares or bonds or whatever have you, right? So the factor market is where the market for these facts of production. On the other hand, we have and services that are and then sell to households for money. Okay. The only reason why firms want these facts of production because they in turn use these facts of production to produce goods and or services, which they in turn sell back to us, All right? So for example, let's say you work in a bank, right? You are providing the bank with your labor, all right? So your labor is being marketed in the, in the labor market. And in turn, uh, you provide labor to the bank and the bank, and the bank produces banking services, which they in turn sell right back to you, All right? They provide some place to put, to put your money, keep it safe. Uh, they also provide some place for you to borrow money uh, if you are staff at better rates than if you were a regular customer. Uh, but they don't give it to you for free. Right. So it's the same thing. All right. But let's extend that to the economy as a whole then. All right. Uh, oh, Ooh, where did I get this slide from? We did this already. Uh, oh, yes, here we go. If you are following in your notes, it's sort of two, two slides over. Um, some grammar issues, if you will. I'm using the term grammar loosely but the idea is that we're adding to our understanding of the economic language, right? And so these are some of the, when we're thinking about economics, so we're gonna pretend, and I'm not really pretend, you're all gonna be econo economists uh, for the duration of this class. So we're gonna begin thinking not as regular people, but as economists, you know? So how do you, you know, economists think? Uh, first of all, because we're looking at an economy as a whole, it's very large, very diverse. All right. We have to make assumptions to help us to simplify these issues that we're looking at and help us to facilitate, facilitate learning. All right. So we make assumptions to simplify and facilitate learning. And a few of these assumptions that we're going to focus some attention on, because these are sort of going to carry us through for the rest of the semester. The first is called the assumption of rationality, All right? the rational assumption. Right? And the rationality assumption says, we assume that individuals always make prudent and logical decisions that provide them with the greatest benefit or satisfaction that are in their highest self-interest. A lot of words, all right? Uh, shorthand is that the assumption of rationality says that people are selfish, all right? They look out for number one. They act in their own best interest. I know, I know, you're gonna raise your hands, but what about all these unselfish people and give their life for another, give their last penny? And the fact that you can quote these examples tells you that those are the exceptions as opposed to the rule. Okay. The rule is we look out for number one. Otherwise we wouldn't be around. Right. Uh, so it is an assumption. That's why it's, it's a, an assumption and not a law because there are exceptions to it but it is true often enough that we can use it as a basis for some of our understanding of what's going on in the economy. So the rationality assumption is we said, we assume that individuals make prudent and logical decisions that provide them with the greatest benefit or satisfaction and that are in their highest self-interest. Right? Not always true, but it's true enough that we can make use of it. Another assumption that's not always true, but it's true often enough that we can make use of it is the assumption of informed business decision-making. Right. And this assumption says that we assume that individuals have all the information necessary to make an informed business decision. We assume that individuals have all their information necessary to make an informed business decision. Now you can never have all the information that's that's out there, all right? But you still have to make decisions every day about a whole host of things. Right? How do you make those decisions? Well, you go on the assumption that you have enough information to make those decisions. 
Now, obviously, this is an assumption because you can't have all the information, but you still make decisions anyway. All right. But from an economic perspective, we assume that whatever information you have is sufficient for you to make a decision. Now, that decision may turn out to be foolish in the long run, you know, but you went with the information that you had at that time. All right. You walked into the store and you buy that dress, and for whatever reason, that's the dress you liked. That's the one you plumbed down for it. And you walk out of the store, and you know, two days later, you find the same dress for half price. Yeah, but you didn't know that. All right. You wear that dress at a wedding and find two other people wearing the same dress. Yeah, but you didn't know that was going to happen. All right. You went by the information that you had available to you at the time. All right. You made an informed business decision, but it is an assumption for various reasons. And then there's this lovely Latin phrase, ceteris paribus. And you see Latin pops up a lot in, in economics uh, and math and a lot of other things. Um, I don't know if they do it, they still do it uh, nowadays. But when I was in high school, we had to take Latin. It was mandatory from form, from what? Form, from one to form five, entire five years of high school, we had to take Latin. In addition to that, we had the choice of one other foreign language, either French or Spanish, but you had to take Latin. And the reason why you had to take Latin because it was considered foundational. Because you know, Latin is the foundation for all the Romance languages, uh, English, Spanish, French, and Italian. I don't know about German. I think not, I don't think German, but certainly English, French, Italian, and Spanish all originate from Latin. And, it, and I can tell you for a fact, it certainly helped me in terms of being able to successfully do both um, Spanish and French all the way through university. I can't speak fluently anymore, because you know if you don't use it, you lose it, but I can still read and write in French and Spanish, Latin help. Anyway, uh, the Latin phrase is ceteris paribus. And, um, it, the best translation is holding all else constant. You can also see it translated as all other things being equal. But what it means is that when you're making a decision, all right, you tend to focus on just one factor that's going to affect that decision and assume that all the other variables is not going to ultimately impact your decision. So let's go back to this old dress example. Um, let's say uh, you have a wedding coming up and you decide to go into 17 shop. That's on whatever that is, Collins Avenue. Yeah, moderately, moderate, moderately priced uh, women's dress store. All right, because you're looking for an outfit for this wedding. All right, uh, a number of factors are going to, should come into, into your conversation. We got money for it, either your money or somebody else's money. Um, color, style, do you have accessories to go with it? Do you have shoes to go with it? Buy to go with it? Um, you know, the whole jewelry thing, go with it? I don't know. All these things are going to be factored into your decision about whether you can pick up this particular dress. The setter's power of assumption says, you know what? Really, you're going to focus on just one. And you're going to assume the rest are, are not terribly important. It may be that you focus only on the price. Because, you know, you couldn't believe that, you know, 70 had this dress for this price. All right, you can snatch this up now before they change their mind. Or you can't believe that they're actually trying to charge you this much for this dress. Uh, you suck your teeth and walk out the door. Regardless that that's a perfect dress for you, it fits you just right. You know you can look, but not at that price. Right. Or the price looks good, the dress looks good, everything looks good, but you know your sister-in-law got the same dress. Yeah. And you just know she can show up in a wedding in this dress. Right. So you ignore everything else, and that one factor, that one variable, is going to affect your decision. So the setter's power of assumption says that uh, 
we get to ignore everything else and not just focus on the one, all right? So is when we say hold all else constant, one assumes that all other variables, except those under immediate consideration are held constant or unchanged, all right? So you, obviously this is an assumption because it can't always be true, but it's true enough that we tend to focus, most often actually, we tend to focus on price more than anything else. But there are lots of times when our decision about purchasing a good or service does not necessarily depend on the price. I'll give you an example. Um, you go in the food store, and as part of your regular weekly shopping, uh, you get um, pancake batter and pancake syrup. Um, you know, you, you, you can't get a batter without a syrup. Uh, you certainly can't get a syrup without a batter. Because, you know, if you run out of the batter, the syrup can sit in the door of the fridge until, yeah. until that's, that's just the way it is. Now, of course, you have some people who try to put it in tea, like honey or something, but no. it ain't the same. Yeah. And of course, yeah. you, you, have, you have some people who, who try and swing their kids. You have the pancake batter and you put a little sugar in it. Right. So here's the issue then. You're in a food store, you pick up your usual, you pick up the, the anti member pancake batter, and you look at the syrup and the price chunk. I mean, I just say gone up a couple of pennies. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and you suck your teeth. Mm -hmm. Hell to the no. All right. You ain't get the syrup. Any reason to get the batter? So your decision about buying the pancake batter had nothing to do with the price of the batter, but it had everything to do with the price of the syrup. So the price doesn't necessarily always have to do have to be the driving factor. Sometimes it can be something else. All right, but whatever the something else is, the setter's purpose assumption is saying that you know we're going to focus on just one. You know, and we're going to assume the rest is not going to affect our decision. That's what when we say holding all else constant, we mean we're going to assume the whatever other factor, even stuff that we don't know about, is not necessarily going to impact our ultimate choice. But you can see why it is an assumption. All right. What else uh, can we, in terms of our economic way of thinking? All right. We think on the margin, we look at small changes and then assess how those small changes affect our overall thinking and overall analysis. Right? We think on the margin. Uh, let's just get our uh, definition of the assumption. Uh, we consider small incremental or marginal changes to determine where it is desirable to change the level of economic activity. Um, go back to our supermarket example. If you notice, if you're a regular shopper, and you, know, you pick up basically the same stuff every week. You would have noticed that the price of your regular item fluctuates, right? I know we, we, we tend to think that prices only go in one direction. Yeah, but if you if you pick up the same item every week, you see sometimes it goes up a couple of pennies, sometimes it goes down a couple of pennies, and you kind of wonder what the heck is going on, right? Uh, if you take your, your, your purchases to the cash register, uh, we don't have cash registers anymore like in the old days. They just have a cash drawer. They actually, the cash registers nowadays are basically a computer. And it's not, it's just keeping track of the sale, but also sending notifications to the accounting department and the, the warehouse and all this stuff to say what is left in store and how much is still left. All right. One of the key things that, that they track uh, from their cash register sales is how much of an item is sold at a given price. All right. Uh, so let's say we're talking Hellman's mayonnaise, regular size, that's what, 18 ounce jar. Mm -hmm. right. And I priced it at $5.95 uh, this week, and I see how much it sold. Uh, next week, when I restock, I price it at $5.97, and I see how much it sold in the course of the week. Week after that, I price it at $5.93, and I see how much it sold. I am now able to get a very clear picture. Your battery's running low. Okay, I'm gonna do it now. 
Sí, te era ya pago. Ah, la plug was half out. Ah, sí, el plug es so proud. Okay. okay um, but the idea there is that they make small changes in the price from week to week and see how it affects their sales. And that, and that so let's say, for example, same Hellman's thing, and at $5.93, uh, they sell 200 jars a week. Now they increase to say $5.94, just two cents. That's less than one quarter of 1% increase in price. And they see that uh, their sales didn't fall off. Okay, so we go up another two cents. No, they jump straight at me. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, a well-managed supermarket won't do that. They go another two cents and see what happens. Because they know if they jump straight, right. Yeah. If, if they jump straight, Y'all can notice. And y'all can change. We did notice eight dollars and something cents. That's what a jump do. No, y'all messing up. Y'all messing up. No, we just tell you when it reached the eight something. Yeah, we don't pick it up. Yeah, I'm gonna increase. Yeah, but see, they are not gonna jump from five dollars to eight cents across a week. No, 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 uh -uh. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. They jump straight to the Asia. Two different things we're talking about here. No, yeah. All right. All right. One, uh, you guys are talking about supply chain issues. Right. All right. Okay. Uh, and okay. that's not our, our, our concern at the moment. I'm talking regularly managing your inventory. Okay. Yeah. I have, if I increase my, my price gradually, I'm looking for a price in which if I increase any more, my sales start to fall off. Then I know that's the maximum price before my customers start rebelling. So what I do, let's say that that turns out to be six dollars and fifty cents. Yeah, right. I turn, I know next week I lower my price to six dollars and forty nine cents, and that's why I stay. Right. So at the item we talk marginal marginal changes. Is that we you make this slight change until you see there's a significant change in the outcome, right? And that affects um, your decision making process. So what we're looking for, and and we'll talk a lot about how these marginal um, marginal changes affect our decisions because well, remember now we're talking big picture. So we talk about how does these marginal changes affect the entire economy? Right. When we have our policymakers. And we're less concerned about politicians because they don't really make decisions. The decisions are really made at the permanent secretary level, right? And then the politicians just sign off on it and you know, they get all, all the benefit or the reverse. Um, but the day-to-day -day operations of any ministry is really in the hands of the permanent secretary. Right? Um, and lastly, uh, I've used the term a lot, but um, we use term variables. And variables is just simply, um, it's a factor that we take into consideration. All right, we call it a variable, but we call it a factor. It, it amounts to the exact same thing. All right, so variables are all facts that we may take into consideration in the decision-making process. Okay. Ooh, good time, good time. All right. Let's see if we can put a little bit of our, our vocabulary to work, right? Uh, and here we're talking, when we're talking about economics, right? We're trying to lay some foundation of our, for our policy discussions where we can have all the good arguments about uh, politicians and $8 prices by, by super value, et cetera. Uh, there are five key principles, there's five, I, I put six. There are more than five, but are we focusing? I think I have six. We'll see. I'll see when I get to them. But these are the key economic principles, all right? These are the foundational um, support for our understanding of macroeconomics, economics in general, but macroeconomics specifically. Right? Foundational principles. 
right? And these are very important. Uh, and what, what's going to happen is that we want to make sure we have a clear understanding of these. So we ask as many questions now because we will be using them sort of as background for a lot of our discussions, right? So uh, the first is called the principle of opportunity cost, also known as the next best choice, right? I'll read it off and then we'll discuss in a moment. You are back? Okay, good. <laughs> I, I, I see faces, so I'm assuming you are back. <laughs> all right, I don't know. Yeah, all right, so what's going to happen come Wednesday? Uh, we're going to be on my system as opposed to the school system, and we'll see if it makes a difference. Okay. Uh, next best choice. All right. What would you most rather have been doing with that money that went to your mortgage? That's what you sacrifice. All right. That's what we're talking about. So the principle of opportunity cost is not about any alternative. It's about the next best choice. What you most rather have been doing. So here it is. <clears throat> Economics is all about making choices and sacrifices. An opportunity cost incorporates the notion of sacrifice. No matter what we do, there's always a trade-off. We must trade off one thing for another because resources are limited and can be used in different ways. By making a choice to consume a good or service, you use up resources that could have been used to acquire something else. All right, principle of opportunity cost is the next best choice. I'm hoping that that is reasonably clear. We'll cover it again, and it certainly it will come up in terms of uh, your homework come next class. All right. The next principle is the, the what we call the marginal principle. Remember, we said economics we tend to think on the margin, small incremental changes, and the marginal principle embodies this. So let's get our principle down, and then we'll discuss it. The marginal principle is based on a comparison of the marginal benefits and marginal cost of a particular activity. The marginal benefit is the additional cost resulting from a small increase in some activity, whereas the marginal cost is the additional, did I say that right? The marginal cost is the additional cost resulting from a small increase in some activity. So what, we, what we're doing is that we're weighing the extra benefit from engaging in some activity versus the actual cost from engaging in that same activity. Right. So in our example, in your notes, we talked about a firm um, who is looking, a, in fact, this is a service station, and this service station is looking to the side 
if they should stay open a little bit longer, all right? Uh, normally, this the station closes at eight, and it's deciding that it's, is it going to stay open um, for long hours? Because as you would expect, there is some cost and some benefits to staying open longer. Right. So let's, we're assuming for a moment that this station that normally closes at eight decides to stay open one hour or longer. All right. So between hours of eight and nine, it makes an additional $1,500 income. Whether it's selling gas or selling stuff out of the store, it makes $1,500. All right. Does that make sense? Yes. Right. Fine. But there's some extra cost of staying open that extra hour. There is some utility cost. Uh, but there's also some cost to some labor costs. Uh, you have the guys on the pump. Um, you have the cashier. Right. So you have some additional cost. Uh, but in, in essence, we're saying that the total extra cost is actually it costs you an extra $200 to stay open that extra hour. Right. Do you stay open? Yes. Yeah. Right. So you made $1,500, but it costs you $200. So in essence, you make additional $1,300 $1, profit. All right. So you see that, that little letter on top of the $1,300. That's the Greek letter PI, uh, P -I and it stands for profit. Right. So now we went from Latin to Greek, but you know, so be it. Right. And whenever you see the Greek letter pi, almost anywhere, it means profit. Right. Uh, if you see it in a pure math problem, it's it, it's two point seven six four three, and it goes indefinitely. Two point seven six four three. Right. Two point seven six four three. Right. But it's a never-ending value. Yeah, you know, we had this competition uh, when I was at university because you know we we're nerds. Um, the most pi and pi and who can remember the most the most numbers, <laughs> numbers after pi? I mean well, after that five or six, bro. After that, you were no, we had people going like forty and fifty numbers wow. after us. Like I said we were nerds. <laughs> yeah. Listen, we also did silly things like um, we have you know like how uh, there was this. Um, TV program called, I can't remember the name of it, where one of the one of the persons would start a sentence and then the other person picks it up in an improv. Oh, yeah. We used to do that with languages. Yeah. That's, the, that's I mean, pretty that's cool. Fun, right? Okay. Yeah, it's fun. But then you have people who went like, you know, it was it's fun when you start, okay, you start with with, with uh, a sentence in English and then somebody switches to Spanish and then somebody switches to French. And then somebody switched to yeah Mandarin, and then someone switched to Greek, and then they start doing it Latin, and then they do you know some old you know language that nobody ever heard about. And yeah, it was fun. Okay. Anyway, the things that amused us. All right, so back to our service station. So we said they made less than thirteen hundred dollars an hour. So they figured, yeah, we can stay open. All right, so we stay open till nine. What if we stay open till 10? Okay, we'll see. Um, how much money do they make when they stay open that extra hour? Oh, you mean about 10? Yeah. They'll make an extra 750 in profit. No, 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 no. Oh, Between nine want... and 10. They make not $1,000. $1,000. $1,000. Right. Now, not as much as, as, as eight to nine. Because right. you know, um, nine o'clock people start thinking about. I got, uh, yeah. yeah, I catch this gas station in the morning. Right. All right. But so they, they don't make quite as much a thousand. Right. Uh, the cost goes up because you know you're gonna pay the girls an extra hour, you know, right. for an extra right. hour. So the cost goes up to two hundred fifty dollars an hour. All right. So they make seven hundred fifty dollars profit. So yeah, man, we can stay open at seven hundred fifty dollars. All right. Fine. So we stay open till ten. Question is, do we still open until 11? All right. it, between the 10, 10, 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock hour, we made an extra $750. Right. But our costs continue to go up. All right. we, it costs an extra $300 for that hour. But we still walk away with $450 profit. Right. Okay. The question now is that, do we stay open until midnight? No. 11 to 12. <laughs> Why? 
no profit. We collect 400 and pay 400. We made 400, but it costs us 400. Yeah. So our marginal benefit is exactly equal to our marginal cost. All right. So the benefit of staying open at extra hour is exactly equal to the cost of staying open at extra hour. So we walk away with nothing. Right. Okay. Do we stay open till one? Just working after for nothing. No, no. one, you start losing money. Yeah, now we, we got a higher security and yeah, you know, and then well, twelve o'clock. Kicking it again. Yeah, you know, and yeah, you know, ain't nobody coming in. Not not a kind of time. No definitely. And then we still ain't definitely staying open until two. Losing money, losing money. So you get the idea, and and you can see now all we've done is graph those numbers. And we can see where the cost and the benefit curves cross. And we see that's exactly at 12 wow. o'clock. Right. Here's a question for you. Do we stay open until ten thirty? Ten forty five. 10 minutes 11. What do I mean? 10 minutes to 11, we'll be closed at 11 o'clock, yeah. okay? Five minutes to 11. Are we still open? We still open to the yeah, public? Yeah, That's what I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it makes sense. Um, uh, see, this is why we're talking economics. The marginal principle says that, and, and right now, um, our numbers are not um, um, granular enough for us to see this but we should be able to see how much extra money we make for every minute that we stay open. So just the companies that use to determine whether or not it makes sense to be 24 hours or not. No, no, much more deep than that. <laughs> All right. The marginal principle says that, you know, um, one should in increase the level of activity as long as the marginal benefit exceeds the marginal cost. And one should reduce the level of activity as long as the marginal cost exceeds the marginal benefit. I said, as long as you're making even a dollar in profit, you should stay open. This one taken the consideration out of pocket, that we spoke earlier. Like, like, like what? Like, like, uh, like what? Like, uh, like what? Like, uh, like what? Like what? Like what? Like what? Like For example, um, all right, so this is just looking at the plain figures. I mean, it'll be an economic, but I mean. What, 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 what plain figures? Like, 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 like what different? The profit and uh, well, this okay. is the profit rate. Yes. Over what do you factor me into this that, that you think should be considered? Well, we got to take in the as more audience with runs the business and just, for example, the staff might necessarily agree with one of the workers that the actual That's going to affect fire them and I do staff. Oh, oh see, well, okay. yeah, the never idea. mind. Yeah, <laughs> never mind. No, otherwise, if you don't talk economics, what do you mean? This is your station. Taking figures to see, so that's why I said, yeah, yeah, you can't. Yeah, you can't I, and even if you close it at 10 30, it still, still takes time oh, for them stop, to close up. Stop, like, stop. you have to add an addition, you ain't adding that year, additional half an hour. Because if you close at 11, we still got to factor in 11 15, 11 30. Ceteris Parabus. He is assuming everything good. That's, yeah, yeah. I ignore all of that. I only <clears> focus <throat> on the thing that's money, most important. Money. The profit. All right. Yeah, okay, I got Ceteris Parabus. Right. If these persons got a problem working for me, plenty of other people need jobs. Ah, bro, you cool at all? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not in the business of managing your life. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I have a job. You need a job. Ceteris parabus. <laughs> I can focus on now. It may be, you know, that you know, I may, I may at some point need to focus on your issue. Yeah, uh, wow. maybe. Interesting, interesting, interesting. All right, uh, but um, you would have to make it clear to me that it it's it costs me more, you know, um, to keep you working that extra hour than to let you go home early. Okay, I need I, I, that's something I would have to factor in. Yeah, it may be that now I have I have people I I have you and the other girl working shifts. Yeah, you know, one girl come on at ten for two hours. Yeah, you, know, you go home, but you don't get that two hour overtime money that you may otherwise make. Yeah, you know, the other girl may decide. You know what? <laughs> listen, than two hours. Yeah, no, the other girl may decide. Listen, that two hours are double pay, worth more to me, so I can stay. 
Okay, but the principle is the same. Yeah, um, the, the practice may, may vary slightly, but that doesn't change the principle. The principle says you would continue an activity as long as the marginal benefit of that ex ex activity exceeds the marginal cost of that activity. Uh, and you see this in every day. We, uh, we do this as a common sense thing, although we don't think about it. Let's say in my younger days, uh, you know, uh, get up on a Friday, uh, I may find my way out on the key. Yeah, I, I know there's a scene like that. I think that I'm so clever, but you know. Log in the end of day. Yeah, I used to chase skirt because, you know, yeah. it's a skirt. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, yeah. all right, Friday, like someplace like a day, today, hot, humid, and you knock off five o'clock, you end up on the key at first bit. Uh, nice and cold and crisp. I go down so good. The benefit of that first bit. Six dollars. No, 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 no. The benefit, the cost is maybe six dollars. But the benefit, that satisfaction, that thrill, that cool, cool. Oof, first bit is a good beer. Yeah. What about that second bit? Because you know, once you get the first one, you got to follow with the second. Yeah. All right. You you don't try to see no more. All right. Because the first bit take care of that. So you don't get. The food, not that same benefit that you got from the first bit, right? So your marginal benefit of the second bit has gone down, right? What about the cost of that second bit? It's still six dollars, but you also have to factor in, into into account now. You got a lot of call in your system. Your, your judgment ain't ain't what it was before, right? So your costs have actually gone up. What about the third bit? And that third bit's still going down, mind you. Yeah, but the, but the benefit of the third bit ain't nothing like the benefit from the second bit, and definitely ain't like the benefit from the first bit. All right, but now you had, if you had like my, you know, a little swing, yeah, um, still six dollars, but now the cost I go up because now people start looking good. <laughs> that wasn't looking good before. <laughs> he said, you know, and you know, you. Yeah, you, you 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 don't overlook things that you used to overlook before. Right. Somebody <laughs> brush up against you, uh, stuff will, happen. Anything will get good. Right. You know, and then now you got to try and drive home. Yeah. All right. The cost goes up. At some point, all right, you have to make a decision that you know what. Five exactly. Too much or whatever. Too much. Right. right. You know, because marginal benefit equal to marginal cost. That's where I start. Yeah, for me that was somewhere around one and a half bears because I was never had a strong head. But I know some guys who that point was five, six, eight bears in. Okay, but you get the idea: marginal benefit versus marginal cost. And now it cost my thing going. Um, all right, fine. The principle of diminishing returns, very similar to the marginal principle. Uh, and very often uh, we struggle to keep these, these two separate. The principle of diminishing returns, if output is produced with two or more units, uh, we increase one input while holding the other input or inputs fixed. Then beyond some point called the point of diminishing returns, output will increase at a decreasing rate. All right, let's see if we can make that make sense. So you have a little piece of land, ain't much. You know, we ain't talking acreage. You know, we have a little garden in your backyard, but you got a big backyard. All right, let's give you a quarter of an acre. Yeah, not, 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 not even a quarter, you know, it's half that. All right, and you know, you decide to grow pigeon peas. Yeah, you know, I fell for some green peas and rice the other day, and I couldn't find nobody selling green peas. Green peas, it's You behave, man. Yeah. But... Green peas, not snow peas. Green peas. Green peas. Oh. No, I actually do. You farm. know green peas, right? No, I actually do farm in a different 
Anyway, <laughs> I I gone on the dock because uh, people selling conch and fish and fritters and rice and nobody selling like st stuff, produce. They don't have it to the end yeah, where it used to be. Yeah. Now you go to the dock to the very and they have produce. The produce selling. exchange? Yeah, that's not there anymore. That's where you have to go now? Uh, I don't know. I have a, that's why I know you. Well, well, any of these people are on the side of the dock, dock now used to be selling produce. At the time. Okay, I guess it's been a while since I, you know. I guess they grew up and I don't know. Anymore. They were forced to leave, so no one is on the dock other than the um, people. They were the forced dock. to leave? Not forced, but the government didn't allow them to stay. Like, you know how they used to set up to the side directly under the bridge? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. No, they're not there anymore. And if you go on the dock now, no, none of them are there. Well, I know they ain't there. The question is, okay. they weren't allowed to stay there. It was like a big we're talking about the perishables like they're not there selling it anymore i think majority of them went to the farmer's market well, like, on the weekend. On the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll open from Monday to Friday. One of the road too, but I don't even open on the weekend. Well, I don't yeah, open every day. Only one. You, you have to find people on the side of the road. And then she goes to Compton Road. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to Compton Road. I'm going to Compton Road. I'm going to Compton But I think most of them, I saw a few people opposite, the, is it Awaki? A few of them are opposite Awaki, actually. Yeah. One I know one store. You mean a one-star? Oh, one yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw a few when I drove by on the weekend. I don't know. Yeah, you must be going on the coconut people. How we get on this again? <laughs> <laughs> Did you want a green piece? piece, piece, piece? piece? <laughs> what I want a green piece for? Green piece and rice. No, 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 no. We're planting green peas. Okay. Oh, you're trying to grow something. Right. Seriously. We're growing right. green peas from right. 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 So you got this little piece of land behind your house, mm -hmm. and you decide you can grow some green peas. Mm -hmm. So you plant a bunch of green peas. All right. So um, what are the fixed inputs in this process? The time for the peas to grow. Is that fixed? It, it, it can vary so as I expected. The piece of land fixed. Oh, this is how you only get so much. Right. Right. All right, so okay, let's call it a feel because but a feel sound too too serious. Hey, yeah, yeah. this is a garden plot, but okay, fine. All right, so you have only have so much soil, that's it, and maybe the seeds. All right, fine. Um, and so you plant this stuff and they grow, and you got a bunch of peas. All right, so you pick these green peas. Uh, more you could ever eat, but you give them away or sell or whatever. Um, so, what do you do next? See, damn, I'm good. I'm going to plant some more. In fact, I plant twice as much green peas as I did last year. All right. Um, so, I have increased one input. Would you agree? Yeah. All right. Uh, but we're still holding one other input fixed, right? Space space same space you got to work with, mm -hmm. all right? Your plants grow and you harvest peas. Clearly you harvested more peas than you did the year before, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So your output increased. Third year, you decide to double your planting again. Now your plants, crowding each other because your space is the same. All right. Um, sun ain't getting to all the plants like it was before. All right. And rain ain't getting to all the plants like it was before. All right. So what is your likely outcome? You still get more peas overall. But all in but the 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 less product all wouldn't but, be but a right. Each plant is now producing less. So your output is going up, but 
but it's going up at a decreasing rate. The yield is decreasing. Yeah, the yield is decreasing. But come year four, Hagen doubled it again. The yield is decreasing again. What's going to happen eventually? You will have no product because everything is going to be diminished. The plants are choking each other out. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Now your output is going down drastically as a matter of fact. So the principle of diminishing return says if output is produced with two or more inputs, in our case, it was the number of seeds plus the space, and one input is fixed, which is the space. If you continue to increase the other input, which is your seeds and your planting, eventually output will begin to decrease will increase at a decreasing rate. You get less and less out of each plant and eventually it turns negative. If I were to graph this, it would look like this. Here we go. Um, so this is your yield, if you will. Right. It would increase, increase, And then it starts decreasing. All right. It would increase at a decreasing rate. Eventually, the plateau and then start coming down. All right. So, the principle of diminishing return says this output is produced with two or more inputs. And we increase one input while holding the other input fixed. Beyond some point, called a point of diminishing returns, output will increase at a decreasing rate. I remember I had this conversation with um, some student uh, a couple of years ago. Um, she made a remark and it sort of clicked in my head, sort of this silly um, example of, um, I'm assuming she was having some issues with a boyfriend, a man, or whomever, a husband, whatever it is. I didn't get the details, it wasn't important to me. Um, investing time and energy in this person, in this relationship. Yeah. And she was using this to, for her, it helped her to understand the principle of diminishing returns. At some point, it's no longer worth your time and effort investing in this person because what you're getting out of it is less and less and less until <laughs> you gotta go, All right? They gotta go. Principle of diminishing returns. All right. Then we have the principle of externality, also known as the spillover principle. The principle of externality uh, says, let's, let's get the principle down and then we can discuss it. For some goods, the cost of producing or consuming the good or service are not confined to the producer and or consumer of that good or service the cost spills over onto non-involved parties who did not have a choice and whose interest was not taken into account, right? The principle of externality says that you know, people who wasn't involved in this process are affected by your decision. Right? Uh, you decide um, you apply to government and you got permission um, to build a factory, right. uh, you build your factory, your factory is producing products. So you're benefiting from it, but your factory is also producing pollution. Right. The persons downwind from your factory are suffering because of your factory. All right. They have nothing to do with it. They are making no money from this, but they're still bearing some of the cost. So now the cost of producing at good or service at that factory is spilling over onto surrounding neighborhoods. This is, think of this in, in terms of whenever the dump catches fire. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're in the surrounding neighborhoods, you pay the price. Mm -hmm. right. Do you get any monetary benefit from the dump? No. Right. 
So in fact, the cost of running that dump um, is in fact spilling over onto the surrounding neighbors. Right? Now, we do need to be very careful when we try and apply this, because um, when you're seeking examples, it must be clear right, that this is affecting non-involved parties. So for example, um, let's say uh, there is an oil spill. Uh, you know, we're supposed to be um, searching for oil down south in the Bahamas, but in southern Bahamas, all right? In fact, there's a company called uh, Bahamas Petroleum uh, who had license from the government uh, to go search for oil. So let's say they found some. And um, the arrangement with them was that, you know, um, each Bahamian uh, was going to get uh, $5,000 a year, right, as, you know, um, benefit from this activity. This is not as far-fetched as it sound. In fact, this is the case with um, every resident of the state of Alaska you know, in the US. Uh, you know, they have oil production in the North Slope and you know, um, each family, gets, I think it's $3,000 or $4,000 a year. All right, it's a benefit to them. Now, that happens in the Bahamas and each Bahamian family gets $5,000 a year. There's an oil spill, all right? So clearly something bad happened uh, and the cost of that oil spill uh, is going to be borne by the government of the Bahamas. Right? And we as Bahamas are all gonna suffer, no, not taxes, but just the degradation of the environment. Okay? The question is that, is that an externality? Right? Think about now, the principle says the cost of producing and consuming that good. So the cost of producing oil, meaning the oil spill, has spilled over onto us as Bahamians. Are we an uninvolved party? We get paid, right? Mm. The fact that we get paid. We involved. We involved. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, I see what you're saying. All right. As long as we're getting some benefit, okay. we involved. Okay. All right. Regardless if we had it uh, agreed to it or not, we right. involved. Um, we have to make that money. <laughs> when when they build that that big monstrosity out um, of <laughs> Cable Beach, um, Bahama. Bahama. Right. All right. You know the roads just go straight. Yeah. Right. Use your word. I can use mine. I should not have put any question mark. You put a question mark, man. I should like that sometimes. I didn't have what he had to terminate that. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Let me clarify. All right. I live out west. The road just goes straight. All right. Now they, they route the road around the hotel. You know, maybe can drive around about to save your life, but that's a different story because mm. they're still accident. If you're in the outer lane, you can't go all the way around, oh. around about. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to see some of the issues with, with that monstrosity, right? Can they block off, block off and make the section gated? If you come from the highway, JFK, JFK way. Take prospect Ridge. Yeah. 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 That ain't really a fair. Not prospect. I mean, further down. But so when you go, when you come from the movies, then you do the roundabout. Lakeview, and you I mean, Lakeview Estate, I think. That's what they say. Right. That, was that, was that, that was always there. 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 That we can't do the roundabout, go on. And that ain't really the issue. I mean, that, that's an issue, but that's a you know, small thing. All right. I bugging you. Oh, you bugging me, but, but you know, that's, you know. <laughs> yeah. The hotel got like what? 100,000 of y'all working there? 
And all of y'all won't drive. Well, I'll let you want them get there. Hear me out. Right. So that's the first beginning. Some sort of car pulling up, passing system or something. More people up and down that road. Right. First issue. Second issue, they're going to cut a road past the lake to hit JFK mm -hmm. and on the Gladstone Road. Correct. All the people who live down south now cut that road. come all the way up in my neighborhood to go along Bay Street to go downtown. Mm. So now I got a ton more traffic just tra passing through. Mm -hmm. up normally. All them people who work at a hotel mm -hmm. and none of y'all could drive. All right. It also means now that I get to deal with people. Mm -hmm. All right. I get no benefit from this hotel. So you get his diminishing return. No. And, and and return. Return. It's externality. And no returns. He is losing in the whole situation in his opinion. He I don't be staying in this hotel. He no I don't get no money from this hotel. Money. Ain't no family of mine working in this hotel. I don't even walk through this hotel. I don't gamble in the casino. I don't need to lay on no beach. I don't need to get no massage. No breakfast. No drinks, nothing. Nothing, nothing. nothing. You get I can stay home and drink. <laughs> especially expensive. Get away for the dinner. And I need to go craving. <laughs> You forget COVID, it man, <laughs> craving is for you all the craving, they bring the food to you. Yeah. Right. Excellent. It spilled over onto me. The cost associated with it, this property. No, nah, no, nah, you gotta just your life now. That is something they did. Yeah. Okay, I got you. Is there any benefit to me at all? No, no. I'm an uninvolved party. All right. So two types, two parts of this principle that we want to talk about. Negative externality is what I'm talking about now. Right. Where the cost has spilled over onto me. But there's also, I have to admit, a positive externality, right? Where an activity has had some benefit to you, even though you weren't involved. All right. So, uh, uh, and, and let's say, um, uh, up the road from this hotel, you know, you know, a couple of blocks is, is um, uh, two. Uh, what's called it? Timeshare units, timeshare properties. Mm -hmm. All right. And the value of those properties have gone up significantly because of the hotel. Because you have people who, um, you know, um, want to come to the Bahamas, want access to Bahama, but don't necessarily want to have the hotel experience, they want to have their own kitchen, whatever have you. So they get the timeshare. All right. Um, so in that case, then the hotel being there has benefited them. So the, the hotel being there, the, the the hotel has the benefit of the hotel spilled over onto them. All right. So that the value of their their property has gone up significantly. Right. So it's a it's a positive externality. So uh, the point here is that the principle of externality says that some some events either hurt you or help you, even though you have nothing to do with it. And we need to be able to identify um, a scenario. I provide you with a scenario, uh, and you give me an example of a positive or negative externality associated with that scenario. Say, for example, don't, don't do it, 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 10 seconds. I'm almost there anyways. Ooh, someone did 30. Uh, okay. Government decides to sell fish fry. Whole area. Mm -hmm. Where's your back? And it is redeveloped as a high-end condominium establishment. Okay. Positive externality. 
Huh? The surrounding businesses will probably have more. What's the and they have a public, yeah, yeah, yeah. The value of the property surrounding it probably go up. But I mean, and then they the block they, off the road too. It's, it's some clubs in the back too, where there's some little bars in the back too. How they get the access? Anybody in the people driving to the property to go to no bar? Uh, we're, we're assuming a couple of things now. Sorry, uh, sorry. No, no, I hear you. All right. So uh, right. there is a road that goes to the the port, yeah. the commercial yeah. port yeah. that stays there. That will and, and everything on that uh Okay. So, but you know that there were there was two roads. One they closed off altogether. Yeah. All right. Like a, like a, oh. they move. Right. Yeah. All right. So here we're talking about the property from basically um, on the no northern side uh, of the road going to the port. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, all the way out to um, the road that goes out to whatever that street is to the eastern end. From Nassau Street, right? I yeah, I, I didn't give you know, but like, no, no. You know, know where the police station is, right? Right. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Cross the road from the police station. Right. Did he give some stuff? Oh, but the curve. I don't, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah but the curve one, everybody beach. Right. We're not going further east. No, that's really really good point. All right. Oh, the point way up the road. Crossing the police station. Right, crossing the police station. That's where we start. Are we going to Alaki Police Station? Yes. We're going where the stores are. Right. Knock down all them stores. Sell that property. All right. Now, we put up a wall along the road so that the commercial road stays. Right. Our nice high wall right here. Right. What are we talking about my property for? All right. All the way from here, all the way out to to the other end. Mm -hmm. All right. Fine. Put up gate, put up wall. All right. Redevelop 20-story complex. All right. Okay. What are the external positive externalities of that development? The area would increase the value of the area would increase, would it? Be more specific. Uh, Which I, area? Do uh, you think the cricket club will, will value it go up? Yeah. Why? Because it's across the road. Uh -huh. they, they're going to have to uh, um, expand because they now they should have more clientele mm -hmm. coming not there. Not necessarily, though, because it was a private time, you know what I mean? It's the people who just be walking about the whole ship, anybody in the Nagoya for. So that's so actually a negative. Okay. For, 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 for no, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying you're right or wrong. I'm saying. It's an argument because what you'll find with economics, and this is going to be true of this class a lot, mm -hmm. uh, we just want to make sure that our argument is consistent with our economic understanding. Right. Now, you may say cricket club, the value may go up, and he may say it may go down. But uh, in terms of the economics, you will both be correct because we don't know for sure, but we know that the cricket club may be affected because, because, of, because of the development. Right. Right. We don't know whether that effect may, effect may be positive or negative. And one may argue, one may, one may argue the next. Without additional information, we can't say for certain, but we know that economically it makes sense that they would be affected. Something's going to happen. All right. So what you would want to do then, if you were given that scenario, is come up with both. All right. You may decide that Cricket Club uh, uh, benefits positively. Okay, fine. I can accept that and I give you a mark for that. Yeah. Now, what about the, the opposite? All right. What would negatively be negatively be affected by that development? During, I mean, if they doing construction, like starting the building, and they have a lot of dust and all the rest of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, no one come in. that is Why is the construction going on? I no one come in. I that. Okay. That is no, true. I suppose. I mean, not necessarily cricket club, but in, in, any anybody yeah, else yeah, will be negatively thing. impacted. Oh. Right. Yeah, you, you could you could argue traffic. Yeah, yeah. Traffic. yeah um, certainly while construction, nice. because the fact that you got to drive there every day, um, you're not getting any benefit from it, but you're certainly suffering um, from traffic. And okay. uh, you, you can I argue? Um, okay, it's all about just now. Sorry to cut you off. No, no, by all means. Can I argue? Um, the I guess the negative impact on tourism, but you know, it's less. Stuff for the tourists to appreciate the when they come across. The it wouldn't necessarily no, affect the industry as a whole, but it's just going to be more inconvenient for 
This is like fifth 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 a common thing people just go to it. Okay. So let me see. So your argument will be is less um, tourist attraction. So no, 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 no. You have to you have to present your argument uh, economically. Less so so we, we, we're still if you, we're using the externality uh, assumption. Okay, yeah. All right. So then um, the tourism industry you're saying, or the tourists themselves. Tourists themselves, a lot of uh, well, uh, why would they be impacted negatively? So um, it, the cost of this new development, when I say cost, we don't necessarily mean financial cost, uh, but development costs, et cetera, is spilling over onto visitors because it diminishes the value of the experience. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good way of wording. That's a good way of wording. That's what what the I know it's a good way of wording. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to say that as well, the is now order of a job okay. relocated. Now, now you're good. Now you so uh, this development is going to cost me to lose my stall. Mm -hmm. Did I get any benefit from this development? I don't know. Are they going to pay now? Them? Are they gonna pay so more? Am I saying you? It ain't like you. You, you make it sound like you make it sound like you don't live in the Bahamas. Yeah. 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 But a lot of them are along the beach and they don't really own the beach. They don't really own the property. They don't own the property. All that all is leased or rented. So they just lose their store location. They got to find somewhere else. All, all, all we've done is we, we've not renewed the lease. Their workers lose jobs. Okay. Ah, see, now you begin to think your way through this. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're thinking of all the people and okay. services and buildings and processes that are not, that, that suffer because of. This development, but only now is very careful that they are not involved. Right? If the government is paying them a penny to relocate, then yeah. you can't yeah. use them. All right. Okay. All right. Um, almost there. Let's see. Uh, here, okay. The reality principle. We got time to, to finish. And if you know, if you don't, we'll, we'll pick it up on Wednesday. Uh, we'll complete it on Wednesday in any case. Uh, because I do want to have a full uh, go through these one more time before I assign homework come Wednesday. Um, the reality principle also often refers to as a real and nominal principle. This principle says, let's get it down right. What matters to people is the real value of money or income that is the purchasing power, not the face value. The nominal value of the money is just what's printed on the bill, all right? If it's, if it's a $10 print on a the bill, then the nominal value of that is $10. Uh, what I'm saying to you is that that doesn't matter to people. What matters is that what you can buy with it, the purchasing power of that money. That's why you often hear, uh, well, I don't know, often, you hear old people say this a lot, you know, where you know, back in the day when whomever what, you, you were making $10,000 a year, and that's enough for you to raise 13 children and a wife and a house, and you know, you're living a good life. Right. $10,000 is what? $100, $100, $100 bills. I'll put it in the chair now. All right. $100, $100 bills now. $10,000. It's the same $100, $100 bills. Same $10,000. Imagine you, your salary is only $10,000 now. Now? Now? That's now. About $800 a month. Now, bro. <laughs> No, but it's it's the same ten thousand dollars, isn't it? Yeah, yeah but, but everything has gone up. up. Yeah. Yeah, but the it's the same ten thousand. Price of living gone, 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 gone up. But it's the same ten thousand. Yeah, yeah gone up, <laughs> when you gotta go in the food store once upon a time, if you spend a hundred dollars, you might have one four or five bags. You spend a hundred dollars, that's one bag. Ah, so now you get to the point. The point is. The money cannot buy as much. The purchasing power of that hundred dollars has gone down. Mm -hmm. right. So that's what we're talking about. The reality principle says that you don't care the fact it's hundred dollars. What you care about is how much you can buy with that hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Right. So you you feel it when the value of what you can buy with hundred dollars declines. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what you care about. Right. Yeah. So the reality principle says the real value of an amount of money is measured in terms of the quantity of goods the money can purchase. Right. So the reality principle says, oh yeah, you ignore the nominal value. You know what? You, you see this? Let's say let's say you have 
um, we want these people who get um, income at the end of the year. All right, and your salary goes up by three percent, but the price of all goods and services go up by five percent. You lose money next year, bro. You're making less money. No, no, you didn't lose money. You, you, your income still went up by three percent. We're able to do less with more money. Right. The person <laughs> power of that has gone down. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. You all scale of that? What, 3%? Yeah, more. That's a little bit. <laughs> and the last principle we're going to touch on before we call it call it night. It's called the, the principle of voluntary exchange. The principle of voluntary exchange, remember our, when we're talking about the rational, rationality principle, that people act in their own best interests, people are selfish, all right? And we use this when we talk about the principle of voluntary exchange, it says any voluntary exchange between two parties makes both parties better off. Any voluntary exchange between two parties makes both parties better off. This means, um, although people like to argue about it, yeah, and I think they're always wrong, you get a job and you agree to work on this job for a certain amount. I don't care how much you tell me, you know, you deserve more. No, you deserve exactly what you're getting paid. You can negotiate for it. Exactly. <laughs> Right. Yeah, but that's considered a job. No. They, they bought it. The thing. Because what if they, they if you all have an agreement and, and they give you more than what you was, you, 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 you first Do you thing. accept it? That's not all of well, it. Often. Right <laughs> right that's not right all of the duties. What does that really mean, bro? That's well, anything. Right. Flo, well. That's anything. But, but you signed a contract, right? You signed a contract, including that code of style. Including that clause. Mm -hmm. oh, that's okay. crazy. And nobody had a gun to your head. That's true. You voluntarily signed a contract. Yeah. Does it make you better off? I don't know. You got money in your pocket that you didn't have before. Maybe at the time. No, I don't know. Then why stay? Well, I have to measure my, what's my See, marginal principle and my marginal As long quality. as you stay, that means you continue to accept I've those conditions. Because you think you are better off with those conditions than not having a job. At all, yeah. So the principle of voluntary exchange, you know, there's this silly expression that I, I see on Facebook occasionally that makes me cringe, you know, between men and women. What's it um, What's the title there? Exchange in a robbery or something like that. Uh, exchange. Mm -hmm. That can mean a myriad of things, but rather. No, man. It doesn't really mean one thing I've ever seen it mean. Woman selling. In the, yeah, I mean, not selling, you know, walking the street. Yeah, but me and you got this arrangement the where. They're, they're yeah. affectionate services. Let me tell you that. Sex. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not only sex, that's on the No, 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 no. It, it, it's sex. Yeah, I didn't grow everything. Yeah. 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 She give you a little bit, you give her money. Yeah, the fact that she enjoying it too ain't got nothing to do with nothing. <laughs> oh, what? I say something you don't know? <laughs> <laughs> I can't know to my wife, man, because you're all playing dumb. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't gonna break money. So that's why they want to break Oh, it makes sense. That's why they want to break money. <laughs> the fact that this seems like news to you? I put on your mind. I know that. Yeah. Thank you very much, folks. We'll call it evening. We'll pick it up on Wednesday. And we will take a quick review of the principles. Um, I will uh, email everybody homework probably, if not Wednesday morning, it'll be Wednesday afternoon before class. So you get an opportunity to take a look at the homework and any questions you may have um, at Wednesday's class. Remember, um, going forward, this will all be online, um, which makes my whole conversation about August 8th and 10th mute. Moot. No, not moot.
moved. Good night. All right, have a good evening, everyone. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much. All right, have a good evening. Thank you, All right, you take care.